The genuine article looks beyond the label to save you money and guide you to value. On this edition, we meet the old school Englishman who brought fantasy, romance and passion back to the bed and the bedroom. Inspired by the ornate designs that French royalty adored, Simon Horn makes hand-carved bed frames using centuries-old techniques. For a similar look, stores like Ralph Lauren offer well-designed reproductions. And for prices you won't lose sleep over, we check out the chains and their bargains. Later, we'll go to London's most reputable chairmaker, favoured by royalty and the rich, but accessible to all. The English invented the modern bed in 1490. It was called the Great Bed of Ware. And ever since, English bed making has been considered some of the finest in the world. But the last 100 years, modern life has made the bed not as important as it once was, until an English gentleman by the name of Simon Horne decided to turn his love of craftsmanship, comfort and design into something we like to call the genuine article. You see, beds were important because nobody had them until recently. Only royalty could afford the kind of workmanship that went into a grand bed. In fact, Louis XIV of France conducted court in bed. He owned 413 of them. In fact, this bed is an exact copy of his wife, Mary Antoinette's favorite bed. What Simon Horn has done is to rediscover the importance and appreciation of beds. Modern design has made them comfortable and functional, but Simon wanted to put personality back under the pillows. Simon bedding, pay attention to those little details and the fact that you can choose from a really, you know, beautiful walnut wood to a rose wood and the fact that they don't use veneers, they use solid pieces of wood. Those are all really important things to keep in mind when buying a bed because they matter and they matter when it comes to quality. Simon was a successful commodities broker with a window office in London until his partner put some old furniture in that window to dress it up. When someone walked in and bought it for 4,000 pounds, Horn realized he was more interested in furniture than pork bellies. But he discovered that all the hand-carved French bed frames that he loved were either too small or too narrow for his 20th century six-foot frame. So he decided to do something about it. You're the man who's credited in England and now throughout Europe and the rest of the world of celebrating the great beds and bringing back not only the design but the craftsmanship that, that made them so. I certainly try to do that. Whether I've totally succeeded or not is not for me to judge, but I think I've helped quite a bit. Up until relatively recently, this room was almost disregarded because we were rather ashamed of it's it. It's the forgotten room that's now been discovered. It was. it was a forgotten room. It was a sort of private, private, private room and it had a divan and a mattress and maybe a padded headboard, but nothing particularly interesting in that room anyway. Being inside Simon's warehouse is a little like a visit to a museum with a distribution center attached. You've got empire beds, you've got this beautiful Venetian bed, and they've all come here from around the world, built in places, decided because of either the availability of beautiful timber or the skills of the craftsmen in that region. Wherever you go, whatever part of the world, there are not enormous numbers of carvers t to carve to European standards. And it took us about two to two and a half years to get people doing it to our standards. Many of Simon's beds are constructed by the finest woodworkers in Europe. In France, he uses the skill of men from the Burgundy region, who use centuries-old wood-turning techniques to ensure the challenge of time and the ravages of daily life are met. What makes the Simon Horn bed so sturdy? It's the joints. There you are. You fasten them with a pin. It's that wooden peg. Once it's there, it won't come out again. But also what is important, it's the joints. The longer it is, the better. And this is why with the Louis Philippe style, we've got a fairly wide joint. And the sides here are, have got the board shape. Simon's love of great beds is shown in his restoration area that he keeps inside his London workshop. So Simon, what is Michael doing right now? 
Michael is one of our main restorers. He, at the moment, is putting on gesso onto this Louis XV side piece. And if you're going to gild something, you need an enormously smooth surface. So all the gold adheres so to the flat go surface. So the gold adheres to it. Mm -hmm. There are no little lumps and bumps in it. Michael, do you ever feel sort of chuffed that you're working the same way they did 200 and odd years ago? Oh, most definitely. It's a traditional method that hasn't changed for hundreds of years. And... Um, Yes, I enjoy it. It's you, you can making go to a bit of history. Sorry? Making a bit of history. You are. Simon's love of history heavily influences his design. For example, the canopied English four-poster bed is actually based on very good reason. You had no glazing bars on the windows. You had curtains to keep you warm. You also had probably a lot of other people sleeping in your bedroom as well. But American four-posters tend not to have a roof. They don't, because by the time you started making four posters over there. Buildings were vastly better created. And so you had these beds which finished about here, just with a finial, as purely as decoration. And, but the, the initial purpose was no longer necessary. So that's the practical side of things. But beds also have their more whimsical uses. Funny enough, this particular design, the, the original one which I've copied, was about that wide. It was a day bed, i.e. both ends of the same height. Is yeah. that what a day bed is? A day bed is... A, is it's an after-lunch nap bed. After-lunch or other, other purposes. Well, I mean, you, you rest on it or whatever you feel like, really, after, after lunch or uh, at other times of the day to read a book or it might be to read do anything else, which is a mind... I think we get you. Got, OK. OK. Well, from British understatement to French flair. The one thing I would say about this is... It's a bit over the top. Some people might say it's too decorative for their taste. Uh, it's got an immense amount of carving in it. Well, that's hand caning. It's just been knitted onto the piece, and this is wax rosewood. It's also a fantasy. This is a fantasy. It's and a fantasy. This is another Very world. Much. It's another world. This is how a wife may see herself as Marie Antoinette. Yes, the new ones which we make will have Marie Antoinette's uh, monogram on the end instead of that bit of carving there. So in a sense, what you're doing mm. is creating the most intimate playground fantasy. And the beds people choose really reveals how they'd like to see themselves. Yes. It's another world they want to escape to. Right. I think it's a dream world, a romantic world, and it doesn't look like their rather modern office, which they left uh, two or three hours before. When we return, the recreation of the greatest bed ever made. Coming up on the genuine article, a bed big enough for a crowd. Simon Horn is already known in England as a legend in his own bedtime, but what he wants to do next will really put him amongst the masters. We've been asked to make the great bed of wear in the V&A, and I suppose that's one of the most valuable beds probably made in, in Europe. Well, for people who've never heard of it. The great bed of wear was made as a gimmick. Uh, for this town called Ware in Hertfordshire. The town of Ware was on a major coach route 20 miles north of London, and the owner of an inn built this bed as a tourist attraction. It was so enormous, a dozen strangers could sleep in it at once, and boast later that they had slept in the great bed of Ware. But these days, Simon has won fame and fortune with his own great bed. Hollywood celebrities like Catherine Zeta-Jones and much of British royalty have appreciated what Simon has done with what he calls his British cot. It's a combination of classic design and his ingenuity. You would call it a crib, and all the finish on it is non-toxic. So even if it wished to chew right. half the cot up and, uh, and eat it for breakfast, it would do it no harm. But this is more than just a crib. It turns into a love seat that will last the grown-up owner a lifetime. It's emotionally attractive and functionally attractive and quite reasonable on the pocket too. And then when it's all over for when it's sleeping all over, in little beds... You can come over here and you and I are not exactly small people. Let's, let's try it out. Come on. So what do you think about the political situation at the moment?
But you see, it's, it's a circle it's, of life, really. Isn't it's a it? circle of life. Here we are. Yeah. Sitting here as uh, grown men, with our teddy on our. Yeah, with with, with your teddy, and um, quite comfortable, really. You really wanted a bed like this when you were growing I up. I would have loved a bed. Like That's this. really what you're really channeling what you didn't get That's as a right. kid. I'm, I'm being deprived. But thanks to Simon's classic designs and customized beds, the rest of us don't have to be. People turn to customized beds for all sorts of needs. It could be a height issue. It could be to look more symmetrical in their space. I mean, it really just depends on your needs. And when looking for a bed, I think you really need to consider the fact that this is probably going to be a piece of furniture that will be in your life for a long time, and it's worth making the investment. If you want the kind of character that a wooden bed gives you, but don't want to pay bespoke prices, you can look at companies like Selva or Ralph Lauren, who make beautiful wooden beds, but they're not handmade and therefore less expensive. Or you can look at some of the great catalog companies that offer wooden beds nationwide, but isn't quite the genuine article. And talking of comfort in bed, the term sleep tight, it came from Shakespearean days where people would tie down mattresses to bed frames with rope in order to make it more secure and comfortable for the occupant, which is exactly what everyone wants in a bed, security and comfort. When we return, a chairmaker so famous, you've never heard of them. I most definitely recommend decorating with throw pillows. They're an easy way to change the look of a piece that you already have. If you're afraid of using a lot of pattern, then I would say use a lot of color. However, if you like to use pattern, have fun with it. Don't be afraid to use a shape other than a square. For example, this is a rectangle. It's a bolster type pillow. It can be used on a bed or the back of a small chair. Using too many different sizes and shapes gives a sort of crazy look. It's great to accent with pillows, but don't go overboard. I would say comfort is the most important thing. You want a throw pillow not only to look good, but to feel good. I recommend finding throw pillows that are made from vintage textiles, that have simple appliques on them, or woven from wonderful materials such as cashmere or wools. Next on The Genuine Article, a chair you can call your own. On this half of the show, we visit the London firm that invented the upholstered chair in 1820, the royally appointed chairmaker to the Queen. Later, we look at more affordable American alternatives and the best of the catalogue collections. Believe it or not, until the early 1800s, chairs were meant to look good but not necessarily be comfortable. It wasn't until an Englishman by the name of John Howard in 1820 decided that they should give support and rest to the weary. He created a chair that was so comfortable it's still made today and considered nothing less than the genuine article. The beauty of the Howard chair is they got the comfort right. Um, they've, they've, they've experimented with the shapes and they've perfected a shape. And the chairs have been designed for many decades, some of them for over a century. And if you go to um, any of the royal houses, to Sandringham, to, um, to Balmoral, to Buckingham Palace, you'll find a Howard chair. Guy Oliver is one of London's most respected designers. His A-list clients include businessmen, royalty, and billionaires. People who can afford any chair they choose but Guy believes that money alone doesn't give you the workmanship that goes into a Howard and Sons chair. Is it true that your company invented the comfortable chair? I mean... We are famous for it, yes. Right. Because the reason being, as you can see, the shape of the side rail here. You can see how it comes here, and then it shapes down into the vital point where you actually sit in the chair, mm -hmm. coming up to the back of the chair. And this is something which was designed by Howard Chairs many, many years ago. Howard and Sons perfected the proportions of the modern chair. They were the first to use down feathers in cushions. And with the invention of spring technology in 1828,
they adopted the classic Serge de Duvet method of construction, a combination of springs, horsehair, and feathers. But their most famous chair, the Bridgewater, became the most copied chair in the furniture world. And it's still made by hand in the traditional fashion. So the springs are attached to the chair itself? To the chair itself, through the webbing. Oh, so if they're put in as a pre-built unit, yeah. they would shift around. This way they're all hand sewn in. So the chair never loses its shape? Never oh. loses its shape. Gotcha. Whether we know it or not, every one of us sits a little differently and proportions our weight differently in a chair, which means the chairs we sit in should have a kind of personalized memory. That's not possible unless you have the chair custom made. And because these chairs are made by hand, every tiny variance in our body's preference can be accounted for. That's pretty special. So what do you put in it that gives it that level of comfort? Because it's still done the traditional way, it is all done with a horse and animal hair. This is bags this of is horse bags. hair? Yes, it is. There's one down here. And what does that give the chair? You can shape it, and it's soft as well if you feel the arm. Well, it gives a little, but it also leaves something of a fingerprint, so it has something of some sort of memory, so I don't yes, remember who's right. sitting in the chair. Yes. Right, now we've come to the stage where he's now stitching up the front edge to give it its shape. If I left it like this, it would move about with time, you see? Uh huh. But by through stitching it all up, it's now going to give it shape and we put like a roll on it. How long have you been doing this, Jeff? Uh, 30 years. 30 years. How long, how long do you think it takes before you get good at it? About 60 years. <laughs> <laughs> Once the horsehair and springs have been lashed into place, Howard Craftsman attached the plush feather sack. It's molded and shaped by hand and now the chair is ready for the final touch. This all here is pinned, and yeah. it's all about to be hand sewn on. By doing it by hand, you get the full beauty of the whole roundness of the roll, and it's hand sewn It's on. the little things, isn't it, Graham? It is, yeah, and that's where the time comes, and the cost, of course. Even at $8,000, some consider Howard chairs a bargain. The cost of a new Howard um, reflects more the, um, the actual cost of manufacture rather than any uh, assumed name or anything like that. They're not a... Um, a famous name amongst the general public. They're only famous amongst interior designers. But there are some big name chairs out there that really it's hype, it's not value, that's putting the price up. That's right. They feel that they've been around long enough for the people that use them to keep on using them. So they know who they are and you better know who they are before you come talk to them. <laughs> exactly. Um, they, they don't have much time for someone who's um, um, an interloper or parvenu. <laughs> when we come back, Seats fit enough for a queen. Coming up. Bottoms down. What started the company's success in 1820 is what they still concentrate on today. Comfort. If you buy one of their chairs and you take it home and it isn't quite right, they will either send someone to that home to fix it or you can send the chair back to the factory and they'll strip it apart and find out what it is that isn't making you perfectly comfortable. I mean, we're quite prepared to travel anywhere in London and around, and we let people have our pieces of furniture for a few days so they can make sure they're comfortable. Let them test run a chair let, in the That's home. right, yeah, that's literally Is it true a man was having a boat built and you flew out to Malta? That's right. To make yeah. sure that the chairs fitted the boat right? Yeah, yeah, that's correct, yeah. So you'll, you'll do anything and we'll go anywhere? We'll do anything, yes, we'll do anything. At one point, Howard and Son's chairs fell out of fashion. But instead of selling out to a company that would abandon these traditions, the owners sold to someone they could trust, their foreman, George Webb. He knows everything about Howard, including how to fit the chair to the man. You, you pick a well, chair. Well, you're a tall man, so I think you need right. quite a bit of depth. Right. Like, so you've lifted me I've up lifted with these you up blocks. With you've the added blocks more that we put on, because what we'd do if we were making this sofa for you, we'd actually make the legs longer. You wouldn't alter anything else. We'd just make the legs longer. In order to uh, hold me and then, right. and then make sure my feet weren't taking my weight. That's right. Uh, they've actually studied how much time the average American male spends in a chair in his lifetime. 
It's three years and 11 months. And he's going to push a remote control an average of 104,016 times. Now, with all that energy being expended over all that time, you've got to make sure that chair will last. There's something called a rub test. They basically have an artificial bottom that goes up and down on a chair. And if it lasts more than um, five or 7,000 rubs, then you're getting into the realms of upholstery um, that, that will last for five years. Um, if it gets up to 40 or 50,000 rubs, then it will last for a great deal longer than that. And if the English pound price rubs you the wrong way, there are a few American options. There's an amazing firm in New York called De Angelis, and they copy a number of English styles, but they also have a great deal of styles of their own, which have um, come from generations of working with um, American and English interior designers. Are they less expensive, more expensive, I equal? I would say they're probably equal. Um, the, any chair um, that's of quality that will last is handmade, and it, you've got to pay somebody within a first world country to make that, so you're paying them the rates that you you pay em employees in, in, in that country, so you're not going to get a bargain. Obviously, if you want exactly the same thing as the Royal Houses of England, Howard chairs are the people you go to. But if you want a chair that's available in America that can be custom made, but by a younger company and at a lower cost, there's a company called George Smith, which can do much of what Howard can do, although not all of the services Howard provides. There is, of course, the crate and barrel option or any other well-known chair manufacturer throughout America that can customize the fabric and the style up to a point, but the shapes are what they decide. And advice from the best chair makers in the world is rotate your cushions and make sure they wear evenly. That'll make your chair more comfortable and last longer, both top and bottom. Thanks for joining us and hope to see you again next time on The Genuine Article. Find out more at fineliving.com. Real information for real people.